I'm, I'm very happy that all the way from Amsterdam we have Mark Engelen here, um, who, who's uh, been such an amazing figure in the ALD world, so it's very appropriate for him uh, to be here. So, um, and he'll be talking about um, guidelines from Amsterdam perspective. Thank you. Well, thank you, Florian, for those very kind words. Um, well, hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I forgot to make a disclosure slide, but I do have a few things to disclose. I um, participate in the Minoric sponsored uh, advanced trial as a local investigator, and um, our group also received research funds for our prospective cohort study from uh, Minorix and Vertex. So, with that out of the way, um, I can start this talk, and I have to say I feel a little bit out of my comfort zone because this is not really presenting about interesting data or things like this. This is basically a sales pitch. And I don't think it's going to be a very hard sell, considering all the previous speakers, but of course there might be disagreement on the specific approach, but, well, we can uh, discuss that. Thank you. The big white button, all right. So, um, this, this talk is going to be really short, so that there is some time left for discussion to see if, uh, if there is enough enthusiasm to move forward. So I would like to uh, talk a few minutes on the subject, if we need a new guideline, an international uh, uh, guideline for the diagnosis and treatment of all patients with ALD, just, not just pediatric, but also adults, then um, how, that, how the process of creating such a complex guideline would have to look, um, discuss a timeline, and then discuss if there's people here willing to participate. So I'd like to start with a few examples from current practice where there is, you know, sometimes uncertainty on what the best approach would be. So um, this is a typical uh, story. An older man, 69 years, uh, recently diagnosed because his grandson was diagnosed with ALD. Um, he had not been to the doctor very often, but he does have a gait disorder. He uses a walking aid. He always assumed that was his age, uh, never sought medical help, but he's otherwise well. So he gets the complete workup. He has no adrenal failure. He gets a, an ACTH stimulation test, perfectly normal adrenal failure. So what do you do? 69 years old. He's not overly enthusiastic about yearly doctor's visits because he says, I feel fine. But what kind of follow-up would you recommend? Um, and recently, um, as Florian already pointed out, we have some, some data that could help make an informed decision. Uh, if you look at this, uh, this graph from a recent paper, you can see that after the age of 40, if you do not have adrenal failure by that time as a male ALD patient, you're pretty likely not to develop it during a lifetime. So I would be okay with only testing him if symptoms arise and not do it yearly. I think that is, that is acceptable. Uh, but as previous speakers already mentioned, um, not all endocrinologists will be completely up to date. Um, so this information recently became available, but it takes a long time before it trickles down into clinical practice everywhere. So it would be useful if the available evidence is peri periodically summarized so that um, you can find it in one spot and get uh, good advice on what to do in specific situations. And also, you know, the same evidence may be interpreted differently. If you discuss this with patients and experts, not everybody might feel the same. Some people say, well, there's a 5% chance I will still develop adrenal failure. I'd like to be tested. So these are things that you could discuss and try to come to a consensus. Another example um, that, that actually shocked us, um, we had a man with ALD who was followed up and uh, he got periodic MRI scans. Uh, and on one MRI scan, um, we, we saw that he had white matter lesions that were not there previously, uh, but they did not then enhance after gadolinium. So um, we did not feel much urgency. We thought, well, that's, he, he's probably not progressive, so let's wait, let's repeat scans. And we repeated scans periodically, and we saw that the lesions increased, but they still did not enhance. And the reason for that turned out to be, um, well, purely technical. Um, as a clinician, I always assumed if you want a gadolinium scan, that's a standard protocol. So you ask for a gadolinium scan, you get a gadolinium scan. It turns out, even in Amsterdam, every hospital has a different protocol. 
there's a different a dosage of gadolinium contrast. There are scan protocols that uh, do data acquisition after one minute, uh, five minutes, 10 minutes. And it turns out in our patient, uh, this is the initial scan, you can see the, the clear white matter um, abnormalities. And you can see on the, the right side of the image that there's no enhancement. Um, but if you wait more than five minutes after gadolinium administration, which was not standard in our hospital, you do get clear enhancement. And this, uh, yeah, the, 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 we might have um, managed him differently if we had discovered that they were actually enhanced lesions. Um, and this, if, if even in one city this is a problem, I'm pretty sure that there's not much consensus internationally. Um, so these examples, I think, um, do illustrate that it would be beneficial to have a more uniform approach to patients with such a complex and relatively rare disorder. And um, one of the colleagues at, at our hospital um, recently published an international guideline for the management of galactosemia. Also a complex disease. People who live for decades with the disorder get complications, but there was also and not much consensus on managing the problems of adulthood, for instance, the uh, osteopenia that they develop. So we figured, hey, why not do this for ALD? Because guidelines are useful for patients, as was already uh, mentioned. If you know what kind of care uh, you should have, you can make sure that even if you live in a more remote area and not close to an expert center, that you get the most important aspects taken care of so you know what you can expect. And for medical doctors, it is nice to have uh, a clear guide for evidence-based decisions and also uh, at least make uniform decisions, the same decisions as your colleague. And that is not only good for patient care, but standardized follow-up is better for research. It makes it easier to compile data from multiple centers. So, um, I talked to a few colleagues, Florian Eichler, Ali Fatemi, and there, there is um, agreement that, that it could be beneficial to do something. So, um, we decided to engage with the ALDA community at this meeting and to see if there is enthusiasm among professionals and advocate groups to get this process started. Um, and if yes, then we would like to proceed. And what we think, uh, the galactosemia guideline um, involved a very comprehensive literature review, a lot of work, um, followed by uh, expert panels that have still have to be assembled. The expert panels review the specific uh, chunk of the guideline they are assigned to. Uh, for example, radiologists for the MRI protocol, uh, endocrinologists for the, the, the follow-up. Uh, and then, uh, after a lot of preliminary meetings, we want to organize a consensus meeting and according to a so-called Delphi procedure to reach consensus and where the evidence is not enough to support a certain discussion, you have a certain conclusion, you have a strict protocol to come to a expert opinion consensus. So, <clears throat> um, if in the discussion after this presentation we move forward, we need to secure funding. Uh, Bluebird Bio already expressed interest, uh, other parties also, oh sorry, <laughs> excuse me. Um, we have um, an, an organization called Adelphi that if we have enough funding that can guide this process. Um, and then we can hopefully come to an expert meeting and I have a strong preference for Amsterdam. <laughs> that is negotiable, <laughs> but I hate flying. So I hope that that is negotiable. Um, so if, and if it all works out, maybe, maybe it's optimistic, but then we can work towards some, some project. So I think I'm well within my time frame. So um, I would like to discuss with you if there is interest in this project, if you think this is a feasible approach, or if somebody has a completely other ideas. Great. So uh, stay here. So. Uh, this is ha exactly how it should happen, which is you set up a talk for discussion. Um, I, I, I guess my first question, having uh, had the talks this morning, is, is if you look at the galactosemia guidelines, um, Dean, can you 
bring me down a little on that. Are the patient advocates and is the patient voice as much part of that development of guidelines or are we talking about an expert panel that's separate from the patient voice? Can you speak to that? Yes, what they did was um, engage the advocacy group. So they were present at the panel discussions and also influenced the outcome. So yes. And to what extent? Yeah, that's... Yeah, they had a vote. Okay. They had a vote in the Delphi procedure. Yeah. I have a th I have a thought. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. With regard. Hello, hello. With regards to guidelines and standards for care, as you're addressing here with uh, the adult variety, I think one of the most one of the most critical components to when we begin to think about standards of care and guidelines as such is the issue of maturity. Meaning there's a difference between a 15 or 18 year old boy who's coping with symptoms, AMN symptoms, and a 35 or 40 year old man. Those are different things. And that maturity component is, 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 is huge in terms of managing yourself and managing your body and knowing what to do and knowing, you know, and I can envision if you're younger, you know, doctors and their guidance and the, and the guidance and influence of, you know, elders or whatever it might be. And then also maturity, not simply in the sense of like age, but also how long have you been dealing with symptoms? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a 30 year old and you just started getting symptoms six months ago or a year ago, and I know these people, I've spoken to them, that's different than if you've been dealing with AMN for a decade or two, 20 years. And so we need to kind of stratify sort of like the different categories um, of, you know, how they all, all those areas kind of get put together. No, absolutely. And um, I think that is perfectly feasible. If the spinal cord disease progresses, you get different problems. And those are aspects you can all give recommendations for. And like the other speakers already mentioned, you need to have um, a good cooperation with your urology department or with the rehabilitation physician. And that's going to be very different for generally for a 20 year old and a 35 year old, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Mark, that's a great uh, set of points. Uh, it might be worth reaching out to some of the professional societies like the Child Neurology Society or the American Academy of Neurology because they might be interested in the guidelines and you can get like, you know, dual publications coming out uh, with, you know, greater sp spread and publicity for it. Yeah, thanks, and uh, I hope uh, the colleagues from the U.S. can, can help with that, yeah. Um, um, so I have a question here from Katie Becker. Um, we have heard three sets of guidelines today. How do we make these recommendations work together cohesively so that they aren't confusing for our patients? Yeah, th that's a good point, and that many people have raised that. Um, but I think, see, I think the scope of this project is, is different from other initiatives. I mean, I think the scope for this project is much broader, uh, both because it's, it, it, it's not focused on, um, on, on pediatric patients, um, and also I think the methodology um, that, that, um, that, that if we do this correctly, we can create some kind of, of, a, of a guideline that's useful not only for a specific setting, so I don't think we need to try to, to, to regulate every little detail, but that this can be a, a broad guideline that can be useful in different countries. But you're right, that's a point. And that is also one of the reasons to, to bring it up here. You know, if, if the general feeling is that it is redundant, yeah, then maybe we shouldn't put so much effort in it. But I, I don't think it is redundant because I think with this methodology you can create something that, that might be genuinely useful. But that might be, need to be translated for specific local settings. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so, so part of this uh, exercise here is exactly to put that on the table. So instead of us all 
pretending like they're not separate efforts happening in parallel to actually, you know, bring it to the table and ask what's redundant, what can be aligned, what is complementary, and can we together actually, you know, be, be even richer for, the, for that? Okay, Karen. Hi, Dr. England, thank you very much for the fantastic talk. Uh, Bella Turk from Kennedy Krieger. Um, to tack on to those previous two questions, which were great, um, together with the Aiden and Jack Seeger Foundation, Alyssa Seeger's spearheaded effort, we're in the process right now of developing these MRI guidelines that Dr. Malik briefly outlined. Um, this would be fantastic. How do we coordinate our efforts? How can we contribute? We would love to be able to contribute, make sure this has international impact, that the effort that we have is not overlapping, but coordinated. What can we do? What is the next step? Do, 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 do. Okay. Hi, Mark. Um, so, obviously, this is something that the UK are very interested in doing. Um, there's huge differences in how uh, patients, both paediatric and adult, are treated throughout the UK. Um, I know that the British Inherited Metabolic Disease Group were quite interested in kind of becoming involved with guidelines and perhaps even testing them out because um, the UK, as you know, to get any guidelines passed is, you know, you have to jump through so many hoops. Um, so it's definitely worth kind of, you know, through us at ALD Life or, um, you know, our associated doctors at, at one of our meetings, in fact, Welter was there, we, we kind of touched on getting some, some guidelines and hassling you about it. But um, first, I'd, I'd like to respond to, to Dr. Uh, Turk. No, it, it, that, that, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and one way, um, my, an idea that pops into my head is that that effort can easily be converted, converted into a working group of a larger guideline, for instance. So that, uh, that, that could be one idea, but that is uh, something we'd have to look at. Yeah. And yeah, thank you for your comment. Uh, it's good to hear that there is interest from, from different countries and that some of the problems uh, are recognizable in, in different settings. So now, uh, yeah. Thanks, Ray. So, so, so we, 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 we don't want to get into each other's way. I, I think uh, it's just because they're different efforts, it doesn't mean that, you know, very specific topics shouldn't move forward. And, we, we want things to accelerate. We don't want to slow things down, but we also want to align, I think. Uh, one, one thing that comes up is, is, is cultural differences. So we're hearing from different countries, different settings, and how universal are guidelines, right? I mean, the settings are so different, right? So you have newborn screening in, in, in New York. Uh, you know, you have uh, scenarios in South America that are very different. Um, where, where the needs are a whole you know, scale uh, different from what we're facing. So I guess, it, maybe, can you <laughs> solve the world's problems and peace and hunger? No, um, <laughs> just speak briefly to what you think, uh, how this should be approached. I mean, keeping in mind that we're not just living in this first world uh, you know, uh, society. Now that, that's a good point, um, but on the other hand, um, I think the, the biology of the disease is the same in all settings. Um, so, um, it, 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 and of course, um, you know, the, the way I, the, I see it, that the problems patients face in, in every country are the same. And of course, one healthcare system is more accessible than the other, so some things might not be feasible in the non-first world countries. But still, I think you can you can make a guideline in which you at least um, delineate the problems that patients will face throughout their lives and uh, possible solutions for that without going into too much detail or without saying this is absolutely how it should be done. But you can say this is how it should be done in an ideal world. And if you have reasons to deviate from that, yeah, then so be it. But, but yeah, of course, and, and uh, of course, it, yeah, you can already see in this, 
yeah, enormous country that even within the United States there are quite striking regional differences. So I think you should avoid making very, very specific recommendations. I think you should stay broad enough for it to be translatable to the, to the local situation. Um, so just getting back to what you were saying, I mean, I think the pediatric portion is already being created, so I think we can combine forces and work on AMN and what else needs to be added, because I agree with Katie's statement, if, you know, three different organizations or groups are creating this, that just leads to confusion, mm -hmm. and especially as a parent or even as a physician, which one will you be looking at? So I think combining efforts is the best way to go about it. Agreed, yeah. I don't know, I don't know if the people are here uh, listening through the video, but I'm gonna volunteer some of the colleagues that we have in Latin America, uh, not to forget that more than half of the patients in the trials of the medications that the developed world is accessing are patients participating from all over the world and from developing countries. So I, 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 this is a great opportunity, and I'm gonna volunteer Dr. Martino and Dr. Kaufman from Argentina, and there's more people from Mexico, Peru, that will be very interested to be part of the conversation mm -hmm. and to help translate the aspects of, we always aim for best care, mm -hmm. but we adapt to what are the providers that can be accessed. Okay. There might not be a pediatric endocrinologist or a pediatric neurologist, in the entire state in certain places, or even the country. Right. Well, to be completely honest, that is something that I did not really consider. Um, those are parts of the world I, I have very little contact with. So that, that's a very valuable comment. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I'll send them your way. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Great. Thanks again, Mark. Huh? We have one more question. Oh, sorry. Um, Pena koutou katoa. Um, ko ka ma papatoku ingoa huiria hau no te tai toki rau me te tai rāwhiti no Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, thank you all. Um, this is this is great. I'm from New Zealand, um, and <clears throat> so we would definitely be interested in something like this. Um, representation from our country would be great for patients and medical. Um, we would be concerned with um, the uniformity like everybody else is talking about um, and specifically the cultural aspects and the social um, side of the condition. Wonderful. Welcome uh, to Philadelphia. We're, we're so excited to have you here. So I'm, I'm just going to venture out and say guidelines are not fixed in stone. They're living documents. And I, and I would very much sort of push back against any notion that whenever we put out guidelines, this is something other people should not be chiming in on or, or, or developing further. It, it's, it, it should be testimony to our community and our engagement and continuous thinking about it. And, that, and really hearing from, from you coming all the way from New Zealand is, is very touching. So. Mm -hmm.